Cymbeline, S. M. Billy N., also known as Cymbeline, King of Britain, is a play by William Shakespeare, set in ancient Britain and based on legends that formed part of the matter of Britain concerning the early Celtic British king Cuno Belline. Although listed as a tragedy in the first folio, modern critics often classify Cymbeline as a romance or even comedy. Like Othello and the Winter's Tale, it deals with the themes of innocence and jealousy. While the precise date of composition remains unknown, the play was certainly produced as early as 1611. Characters In Britain Cymbeline, King of Britain Queen, Cymbeline's second wife Imogen, Inogen, Cymbeline's daughter by a former queen, later disguised as the page Fidel, posthumous Leonatus, Inogen's husband, Cloten, queen's son by a former husband, Bellaria, Spanish lord living under the name, Morgan, Guiderius, Cymbeline's son, kidnapped in childhood by Bellarius and raised as his son Polydor, Alvarugus, Cymbeline's son, kidnapped in childhood by Bellarius and raised as his son Cadwell, Pisanio, posthumous a servant, Cornelius, court physician, Helen, lady attending Imogen, two lords attending Cloten, two gentlemen, two captains, two jailers, in Rome, Falario, posthumous a host in Rome, Iacimo, Giacomo, Valerio's friend, French gentleman, Dutch gentleman, Spanish gentleman, Keys Lucius, Roman ambassador and later general, two Roman senators, Roman tribunes, Roman captain, Philharmonus, soothsayer, apparitions Jupiter, king of the gods, Sicilius Leonatus, posthumous a father, Posthumous a mother, posthumous a two brothers. Synopsis. Cymbeline, the Roman Empire's vassal king of Britain, once had two sons, Guiderius and Alvarugus, but they were stolen twenty years earlier as infants by an exiled traitor named Bellarius. Cymbeline now discovers that his only child left, his daughter Imogen, has secretly married her lover posthumous Leonatus an otherwise honourable man of Cymbeline's court. The lovers have exchanged jewellery as tokens, Imogen now with a bracelet, and posthumous with a ring. Cymbeline dismisses the marriage and banishes posthumous, since Imogen, as Cymbeline's only child, must produce a fully royal-blooded heir to succeed to the British throne. In the meantime, Cymbeline's queen is conspiring to have Cloten, her cloddish and arrogant son by an earlier marriage, married to Imogen, to secure her bloodline. The Queen is also plotting to murder both Imogen and Cymbeline, procuring what she believes to be deadly poison from the court doctor, Cornelius, who, suspicious, switches the poison with a harmless sleeping potion. The Queen passes the poison along to Pisanio, posthumous and Imogen's loving servant, who is led to believe it is a medicinal drug. No longer able to be with her banished posthumous, Imogen secludes herself in her chambers, away from Clotin's aggressive advances. Posthumous must now live in Italy, where he meets Iachimo, who challenges the prideful posthumous to a bet that he, Iachimo, can seduce Imogen, who posthumous has praised for her chastity, and then bring posthumous proof of Imogen's adultery. If Iachimo wins, he will get Posthumus's token ring. If Posthumus wins, not only must Iachimo pay him but also duel Posthumus with a sword. Iachimo heads to Britain where he aggressively attempts to seduce the faithful Imogen, who sends him packing. Iachimo then hides in a chest in Imogen's bedchamber and, when the princess falls asleep, emerges to steal from her Posthumus's bracelet. He also takes note of the room and Imogen's partly naked body to be able to present false evidence to posthumous that he has seduced his bride. 
Returning to Italy, Iachimo convinces Posthumus that he has successfully seduced Imogen. In his wrath, Posthumus sends two letters to Britain, one to Imogen, telling her to meet him at Milford Haven, on the Welsh coast, the other to the servant Pisanio, ordering him to murder Imogen at the Haven. However, Pisanio refuses to kill Imogen and reveals to her Posthumus's plot. He has Imogen disguise herself as a boy and continue to Milford Haven to seek employment. He also gives her the Queen's poison, believing it will alleviate her psychological distress. In the guise of a boy, Imogen adopts the name Fiddle, meaning faithful, back at Cymbeline's court. Cymbeline refuses to pay his British tribute to the Roman ambassador Keys Lucius and Lucius warns Cymbeline of the Roman Emperor's forthcoming wrath, which will amount to an invasion of Britain by Roman troops. Meanwhile, Cloten learns of the meeting between Imogen and Posthumus at Milford Haven. Dressing himself enviously in Posthumus's clothes, he decides to go to Wales to kill Posthumus, and then rape, abduct, and marry Imogen. Imogen has now been traveling as Fiddle through the Welsh mountains, her health in decline as she comes to a cave, the home of Belarius, along with his sons, Polydor and Cadwell, whom he raised into great hunters. These two young men are in fact the British princes Guiderius and Arvirigus, who themselves do not realize their own origin. The men discover Fiddle, instantly captivated by a strange affinity for him, and become fast friends. Outside the cave, Guiderius is met by Cloten, who throws insults, leading to a sword fight during which Guiderius beheads Cloten. Meanwhile, Imogen's fragile state worsens and she takes the poison as a hopeful medicine. When the men re-enter, they find her dead. They mourn him after placing Cloten's body beside hers, briefly depart to prepare for the double burial. Imogen awakes to find the headless body, and believes it to be posthumous due to the fact the body is wearing posthumous clothes. Lucius a Roman soldiers have just arrived in Britain and, as the army moves through Wales, Lucius discovers the devastated Fiddle, who pretends to be a loyal servant grieving for his killed master. Lucius, moved by this faithfulness, enlists Fiddle as a pageboy. The treacherous queen is now wasting away due to the disappearance of her son Cloten. Meanwhile, despairing of his life, a guilt-ridden posthumous enlists in the Roman forces as they began their invasion of Britain. Bellarius, Guiderius, Arvirigus, and posthumous all help rescue Cymbeline from the Roman onslaught. The king does not yet recognize these four, yet takes notice of them as they go on to fight bravely and even capture the Roman commanders, Lucius and Iachimo, thus winning the day. Posthumus, allowing himself to be captured, as well as Fiddle, are imprisoned alongside the true Romans, all of whom await execution. In jail, Posthumus sleeps, while the ghosts of his dead family appear to complain to Jupiter of his grim fate. Jupiter himself then appears in thunder and glory to assure the others that destiny will grant happiness to Posthumus and Britain. Cornelius arrives in the court to announce that the queen has died suddenly, and that on her deathbed she unrepentantly confessed to villainous schemes against her husband and his throne. Both troubled and relieved at this news, Cymbeline prepares to execute his new prisoners, but pauses when he sees Fiddle, who he finds both beautiful and somehow familiar. Fiddle has noticed Posthumus a ring on Iachimo's finger and abruptly demands to know from where the jewel came from. A remorseful Iachimo tells of his bet and how he could not seduce Imogen, yet tricked Posthumus into thinking he had. Posthumus then comes forward to confirm Iachimo's story, revealing his identity and acknowledging his wrongfulness in desiring Imogen killed. Ecstatic, Imogen throws herself at Posthumus, who still takes her for a boy and knocks her down. Pisanio then rushes forward to explain that Fiddle is Imogen in disguise. Imogen still suspects that Pisanio conspired with the Queen to give her the poison. 
Pisanio sincerely claims innocence, and Cornelius reveals how the poison was a non-fatal potion all along, insisting that his betrayal years ago was a set-up. Bellarius makes his own happy confession, revealing Guiderius and Arvirigus as Cymbeline's own two long-lost sons. With her brothers restored to their place in the line of inheritance, Imogen is now free to marry posthumous. An elated Cymbeline pardons Bellarius and the Roman prisoners, including Lucius and Iachimo. Lucius calls forth his soothsayer to decipher a prophecy of recent events, which ensures happiness for all, blaming his manipulative queen for his refusal to pay earlier. Date and text the first recorded production of Cymbeline, as noted by Simon Foreman, was in April 1611. It was first published in the first folio in 1623, when Cymbeline was actually written cannot be precisely dated. The Yale edition suggests a collaborator had a hand in the authorship, and some scenes may strike the reader as particularly un-Shakespearean when compared with others. The play shares notable similarities in language, situation and plot with Beaumont and Fletcher's tragic comedy Philaster, or Love Lies a Bleeding. Both plays concern themselves with a princess who, after disobeying her father in order to marry a lowly lover, is wrongly accused of infidelity and thus ordered to be murdered, before escaping and having her faithfulness proven. Furthermore, both were written for the same theatre company and audience. Some scholars believe this supports a dating of approximately 1609, though it is not clear which play preceded the other. The editors of the Oxford and Norton Shakespeare believe the name of Imogen is a misprint for Inigen. They draw several comparisons between Cymbeline and Much Ado About Nothing, in early editions of which a ghost character named Inigen was supposed to be Leonato's wife. Stanley Wells and Michael Dobson point out that Holosheds Chronicles, which Shakespeare used as a source, mention in Inogen, and that Foreman's eyewitness account of the April 1611 performance refers to Inogen throughout. In spite of these arguments, most editions of the play have continued to use the name Imogen and it has been suggested that Imogen may be intended to evoke the figure of Inogen, but that the slight change in name is deliberate as there are other characters in the play whose names appear to be slight variants of historical or pseudo-historical figures. Reputation Though once held in very high regard, Cymbeline lost favour with critics in the 18th century. The most famous comments were made by Samuel Johnson. This play has many just sentiments, some natural dialogues, and some pleasing scenes, but they are obtained at the expense of much incongruity. To remark the folly of the fiction, the absurdity of the conduct, the confusion of the names and manners of different times, and the impossibility of the events in any system of life, were to waste criticism upon unresisting imbecility, upon faults too evident for detection, and too gross for aggravation. Lytton Strachey famously found it difficult to resist the conclusion that he, Shakespeare, was getting bored himself. Bored with people, bored with real life, bored with drama, bored, in fact, with everything except poetry and poetical dreams, Harley Granville Barker had similar views, saying that the play shows that Shakespeare was becoming a wearied artist. William Hazlitt and John Keats, however, numbered it among their favorite plays. Some have taken the convoluted plot as evidence that the play deliberately parodies its own content. Harold Bloom says, Cymbeline, in my judgment, is partly a Shakespearean self-parody. Many of his prior plays and characters are mocked by it. In Act 5 scene IV, Jupiter descends in thunder and lightning, sitting upon an eagle. He throws a thunderbolt. After stating that posthumous fortunes will improve, Jupiter returns to heaven on his eagle. In one scene, a character seems to say that a plot point is to be laughed at. 